Greetings, everyone. This is Becky DeCoyster and producer Ben, and we want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to be talking about medical cannabis and dementia. Uh, we have a very special guest that I'm about to introduce to you, uh, but before we do that, I just want to acquaint everyone with the program that we use. Currently, um, everyone has their speaker muted. Um, but we do want your feedback and we are curious about your questions. And so if you have a question during the presentation, um, you click on the little the, the icon that looks like a talk bubble um, that you should be seeing on your screen and type your question in there. You can, you can make it public or you can send it privately. Uh, either way, producer Ben and I will see that and we will make sure that we get your uh, questions addressed in a timely manner. So, so, again, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have a very interesting um, conversation. And, again, we, we're joined by a very special guest, Karen McDonald from New Hope Hospice. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Becky. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank you for spending a, a little bit of time with us today. Um, you have a lot of initials after your name. <laughs> can, can you tell us a little bit about what all those initials mean? I like to collect them, evidently. <laughs> uh, I'm a registered nurse. I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing, and I'm certified in hospice and palliative care. Wow. Okay. Um, Talk to me a little bit about hospice and, and palliative care, just a kind of a brief overview. Are they the same thing? Or are they, uh, they, they kind of work together, but um, palliative care is a growing field, and it um, is concerned with overall quality of life and comfort as patients that have chronic illness are undergoing treatment. Mm -hmm. So it focuses on pain and symptom management, um, and just overall quality. Um, hospice uh, is a little bit different in that um, when people are more uh, terminal, generally less than six months left to live is uh, when hospice comes in and looks more at the very end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with symptom management, um, it uh, includes the family as well as the patient as a unit, um, focusing on pain, uh, spiritual issues, uh, closure of life and um, overall quality. Wow, wow, okay. And how long have you been doing this kind of work? Uh, in various levels for many years. Uh, <laughs> I've been with New Hope Hospice for the last year. Um, uh, before that I worked um, at a local uh, hospital um, and worked with a palliative care physician there who uh, was very helpful in, in my getting my certification. Um, before that, I worked for many years in a dementia facility, mm. um, an all dementia facility, and worked closely with um, end of life and hospice in that capacity. So, a little wow. bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, we, we appreciate your, your being willing to share some of your expertise with us today. Um, and, and I think we'll just go ahead and dive right on in if my computer will agree with me. There we go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what dementia is. And you said that you worked for some time in a, in a specific dementia facility. So you have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of people with various levels and types of dementia? Yes, okay. yes. Um, according to your slide, like you say here, uh, Alzheimer's is by far um, the most common form of dementia. Uh, an easy way to understand the difference, a lot of folks say, you know, I have uh, dementia versus Alzheimer's, and they get the terms confused. Mm. Uh, dementia is the um, umbrella term for okay. any kind of cognitive impairment, uh, impairment in um, what's called executive function. Okay. Um, you know, how do I do this planning, you know, thought processing. Mm -hmm. uh, Alzheimer's is a specific type of that in addition to several other types um, gotcha. that you have listed here. Uh, frontotemporal is a certain type. Each one kind of shows up differently. That was uh, a some good question kind of, I had. Yeah. Uh, some are similar. They cross over, so it's hard to tell uh, sometimes, but some others um, have distinct characteristics that you can you can tell. Um, for example, the Crutzfeldt-Jacob disease, which is kind of a, akin to the mad cow disease, is a oh, very okay. rapid progression. Um, there's a certain protein prion uh, in the brain that's affected. Parkinson's, people are aware, usually has the, the physical um, mm -hmm. tremor, rigidity. Um, you know, honestly, I didn't, um, until I started looking deep, more deeply into this, I didn't realize that Parkinson's and dementia were, were linked. That, yes. That yes. I, I had always associated Parkinson's with just the tremors. The physical uh, manifestations. No, right. there is definitely a dementia component with that. In, um, in all Parkinson's cases? or uh, A good number of them. Wow. Okay. Um, yes. They 
every every body is a little bit different, sure. you know, so everyone presents a little bit differently. But yes, it is very common. Um, and then um, dementia with Lewy bodies, we tend to see that as well. Sometimes separate, sometimes uh, with the Parkinson's. Okay. Um, wow. And Lewy bodies are, are developments in the brain. Yeah. This is, all dementias are, are, are it goes on in the brain, right? Correct. It's, okay. Yes. All yes. Right. With Alzheimer's, there's um, there's plaques. There's certain formations in there. It, it can affect different parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, frontotemporal uh, is a very it's similar. Right. Uh, affects the front part of the side, um, and that has to do with uh, uh, behavior, inhibitions, emotions. Okay. Um, so that so might manifest differently yeah. than. Alzheimer's. It used to be called. Called um, Pick's disease. Uh, you know, some people okay. may have heard it, and that's um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, you can't quite control yourself. You know, I want to hug you, and now I really want to squeeze you. I oh, can't wow. myself. You okay. know, it's kind of a yeah. rapid talking uh, behavioral uh, type of dementia. Are there are there symptoms that that are shared among all of these types of dementia? What what do people what, what manifests? What are the clues that there might be something going on? Mm-hmm. Um, well, where Alzheimer's is the most common, um, you know, people start to see, um, would say, you know, my mom's a little different. Something's not quite, you know, I've told her that a few times. She didn't seem to quite get that. Or, mm-hmm. you know, she seemed to be kind of a little confused to where she is. Uh, a lot of these folks are really uh, adaptable at covering early on, no, okay. um, and when a diagnosis is made, the family will sit down and say, oh, you know, well, you know I, can I can think back, back to this, this time, time when I really noticed there was something off with mom, And right. but it's very insidious, it's slow, it's progressive. Um, and when you're living with someone or seeing them daily or yeah, regularly, yeah. those little changes, exactly. you know, you might not... Right. It, it's not as obvious, you, you know, and as we all get older, you know, we have some memory impairment. Sure. A doctor I worked with used to describe it as, um, you know, when we get older, we all lose our car keys. You know, where do they put those things, <laughs> yes. you know? Uh, that's a normal memory loss with, with age. However, right. looking at your car keys and not knowing what does that key for, what am I supposed to do with this object, uh, that's the executive function piece that's changing. That's that's yeah. a, a helpful um example there. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had also heard, and we talked about this briefly before we got online, um, that, that a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, which again is the majority of these cases, uh, can only definitively be made after death. Is that? That's what I had always been uh, <laughs> trained as well, and I think that's changing. I've spoken to a few people, and I, I can't really speak fully to that, but it's it seems like there are some tests now that can be made. Um, scans like of the brain. Or, yeah, or... Um, Okay, where they can recognize that this yeah. is coming. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's let's go on to our next slide because I, I because Alzheimer's is the the majority of dementia cases. We're going to spend a great deal of time focusing on it, um, and and as we mentioned, all of these diseases are are affecting the brain. Um, in Alzheimer's, we have um, you know we we are aware of. Uh, I'm sorry these proteins that are building up in the neurons of the brain and sort of getting in the way of the signals, the electrical signals that are passing information along. Um, and, and there are these two different types of proteins. So, so there's a, the plaques that build up and those are beta amyloids. And then there are also a, a different type of protein called tau and they get tangled. And so I, and if my understanding is correct, ele- electrical impulses are not, it, it's like you're sending them down a road and the road dead ends. Or <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. And yeah. again, this is deep into the science, which mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. can't say that I'm very well versed in that. <laughs> I'm more uh, adept at the symptom management but, on the right. outside. Uh, but yes, you're right. Um, you know, that's how everything, you know, gets out of the brain. It's, right. it's uh, neurons to neurons and uh once there's a, a block in the sy- synapse or mm-hmm. transmission in any way, uh, like with the Parkinson's dopamine, right. you know, there's, you know, that tells the muscles what to do and, you know, there's a blockage there. Those and that's, messages are getting confused. Yes. And, um, mm-hmm. I was interested that visual changes can be part of Alzheimer's. Uh, is that something that you see as well? Is that Absolutely. It's um, very interesting. Uh, depth perception can be off mm. uh, with folks and or uh, I've, a lot of our folks will look at the floor and we see this hardwood floor here with a pattern in it, but to them it's it's very different. Something I need to pick up, I need to get at that. It's, um, oh, interesting. And there's, you know, with certain types of uh, dementia, especially Lewy body hallucinations, you mm. know, they can be auditory, they can be visual. Okay. Um, hallucinations can take place wow. too. And I think the impact on, on 
Yeah, I mean, even just a depth perception issue like that. I mean, think about the tasks of daily living that mm -hmm. become so challenging. Yeah. If every step you're taking, you're not sure if that's a solid floor or, a, yeah. you know, some sort and of swirly pattern. And another interesting um, phenomenon that I saw a lot with my patients is, you know, uh, a a black mat in front of a doorway, say. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of folks will walk up to that and stop because to them it's a hole. Oh, if I my step goodness. in there, I'm going to fall into that hole. So right. they'll work their way around it because that's, and, and you can and tell them that's just a mat, but to them that's reality. The, that's, yeah, that's real to them and it's fear. And, oh, yeah. wow, wow. Just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, we are we are a complex machine, and oh, we are. <laughs> a lot can go wrong. Um, I was also interested to note as I was doing some research on, on you know, preparing for this, um, that in Alzheimer's and possibly in some of these other forms of dementia, the mitochondria of literally inside the cells that make up our neurons uh, get damaged. And and the mitochondria, if you remember from high school biology class, that's the the engine, that's the motor of your cells. Um, and so if if your if your engine is <laughs> Is on it's the not fix. functioning, right, but right, right. And, and it travels down, you know, yeah. one cell gets affected, then the next, and how, you know, right. before long, it re really manifests. Right, so it's a, it's a very deep organic uh, set of problems that are going on and, and mm -hmm. cascading, it sounds like. Um, this was an interesting um, visual that I found as well, that, that brain volume actually changes. Yes. So we're, we're st I mean, starting at that cellular level where the cell itself is not functioning correctly. And then we add in the layer of these proteins that are building up and tangling, mm -hmm. and, and the brain is dying. Is that it is. accurate? And it's, yes, and that the shrunken brain is something that's very visual. I know a lot of family members will say, why are they behaving like this? This is my mother. My mother she would never do this. And mm -hmm. they're very frustrated. And is she doing this on purpose? And, you know, things like that. Because if you have a broken arm, you can see the broken arm. Right. And you can feel for that person, okay, well, they're probably hurting. Look, look what's going on with them. However, mm -hmm. they look just like they always did, yet they're behaving this way. Right. You know, how can I wrap my mind around that? So it's it's an interesting visual to give families to say, see, there is. This is where the damage is. You can't right. see it, but it's in there. But it's happening. Yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about how we currently treat these conditions. And here, I know you have a lot of experience, um, you know, in, in the traditional Western medical realm. Mm -hmm. um, we turn to pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. to, to fix a lot of our problems. So I, I would love it if you could just kind of go through some of these um, drugs and, and categories and what, um, you know, when they're used, when in the course of the disease do they come in and, and, you know, any other information that you have? Uh, well, the two that are most commonly used, or at least that I've had the experience using, uh, the first one, uh, Denezepil, which is uh, Aricept, is the other more, the brand name that mm -hmm. people are probably used to hearing. Um, uh, I see I have early to moderate or moderate to advanced, and it is used um, throughout the course of the illness. Um, the idea is it will hopefully slow the progression. Um, from mm -hmm. what I've seen, what I've families have told me what providers have talked about. Um, there is some benefit, certainly, um, early on in the illness. Mm -hmm. um, as it progresses, it's debatable how, how useful it is as it gets closer to end stage. Um, there are side effects. Um, it's, it's what we have. It's what's, you know, the standard of care at this time. It's what's right. been used. Um, there are side effects. You know, GI, nausea, vomiting is a, a mm. one that I've heard of quite frequently um, wow. that has caused some people just to say it's just not worth it. Wow. Um, other people do very well on it, but it is a, a problem. Here's, here's a, a question um, for you. So it almost seems that this is such a... Again, going back to the, the source, the origin of these problems, are, it's so organic, you know, it's deep in your cells, and, and it would seem that, that almost every case would be quite individual, that, that if, you know, my mom has dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, and somebody else's mom has Alzheimer's, the two courses might not progress at the same rate? Or they will most likely present differently. They, mm -hmm. you know, where in the brain did those tangles happen? Mm -hmm. What part of the brain is affected and what does that correlate to? You know, some people, their speech is very affected and they turn in, they start having something called word salad, mm -hmm. which is, like you imagine, a salad of words. It's just in their mind, they're making sense, but right. what's coming out is something completely different. Other people have uh, decreased ability to walk or their swallow is affected mm -hmm. or 
uh, behaviors or paranoia, fears, um, crying, and, you know, wow. different uh, mm -hmm. manifestations will show up for each individual person. And so the meds will target, you know, different areas and right. have an effect. And and we we might not know. I mean, so we, we start on Aricept, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the the condition progresses rapidly. That doesn't necessarily mean maybe that the Aricept wasn't good for a time. But exactly. It's hard to really tell. It's, wow. Um, I think people, it's what we have. Right. It's what's, what's been there. Um, the idea that something slows the progression of an illness, um, how do we really know without right. it? Because you didn't do it without it. So how do you know that it, in fact, slowed the progression? Right. Um, an right. example would be, you know, I... I don't want to have this a headache that I might get this afternoon if I take Tylenol this morning and I don't have a headache. Did it work? Or uh, was I really going to get the headache in the first place? Right, I don't know. Right. Uh, but however, I, I don't want to say that these uh, have never worked. Um, they have had, uh, some folks have had a, a, a long, slow course and mm -hmm. the families have really felt they were beneficial. And again, providers, this is what they had to lean on. This is right. what was there. So. Right. Let's talk antipsychotics and antidepressants. Sure. Yes. Um, it's kind of controversial. Okay. Um, it is. It's um, seeing it from several different sides. There's a lot of, um, especially in the nursing home realm where I used to work, there's a lot of uh, pressure from um, Medicare um, to and the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medi Medicaid Services, CMS it's called, mm -hmm. um, to decrease antipsychotic use because of their side effects and um, really? the concern that they are being used to um, mask or sedate um, patients that are out of control and, and things like that. Um, there's good and bad in everything. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, some folks that are really struggling with very frightening hallucinations, um, this will decrease Mm -hmm. those hallucinations, which is a comfort. Yes. Uh, however, um, they can be very sedating, leading to falls. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people still want to get up and wander and walk around, and, you know, now they're sedated and up and walking and wandering around, and so, you know, falls become uh, more prevalent. There's side effects yeah. with um, a lot of these antipsychotics um, that can be permanent sometimes once they've reached a threshold in their system. Um, so what, are, what are some of those? Um, they're uh, continuing mo continuous motions. They're called EPS symptoms. There's uh, um, like normal, or, yeah, kind of like okay. a tick or a lip oh. smacking. You've seen some people do that. Um, you know, facial tics, mm -hmm. and then of course there's some other more serious ones that could uh, be be permanent or, or in you know cardiac effects. You know, oh, there's wow. a strong cardiac issue, and it's that fine line of <laughs> how uncomfortable is this person right. right now in this moment, and you know, is the the benefit going to outweigh the risk right now? Right. And so that's where providers are at and families are at, yeah. having consent because this person is at this stage most likely not able to make their own decisions so families are charged with trying to what would what would mom want me to do right now what am right. i supposed to do right it's difficult yeah well and that's a that's a uh, we, we should take this opportunity to make a plug for advanced directives Absolutely. and having these conversations with elder parents or loved ones that's a passion of mine Is I'm quite vocal about <laughs> we'll talk, talk to us a little bit about that <laughs> it's a uh, no one's getting out of here alive. That's my catchphrase. We're all going to reach this point in yeah. some way of, of dying. It's the human condition. So um, how do we want that to look? Right. Like, you know, that's where we are now. If we're alert, we're oriented, we can take back a, a moment and say, you know, what do I want to look like? Do I want aggressive care at end of life? Do I want to be kept comfortable and kept at home? Do I want every possible thing to be done? Mm -hmm. um, how are providers supposed to know if, if we're not communicating that to them? Right. So. With our families, it's important. With our primary care providers, it's important. And a conversation absolutely is the first step, but getting it in writing and mm -hmm. having it travel with you wherever you go is very important because you never know when you're going to be in that state where you can't speak for yourself anymore. Right. Right. And uh, there, everyone around you will be able to pick up and do what you want with yeah. them. It's, it's yeah. absolutely crucial. So can any physician help a person absolutely. point them in the right direction absolutely. to start working any on an physician, advanced directive? Any uh primary care office, when you're in the hospital, um, you can go online most places and download advanced directives. There's gotcha. a new, uh, it's called a POLST form mm -hmm. um, that is being used and there's, it's it's out there, you just need to reach for it and a lot of people just say, yeah, that's a good idea, I'll get to that sometime. It's not something <laughs> that we want to think about, right? We don't, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. an unpleasant uh, topic, we right. want to, but it it's needs to be done. But it's real and, and mm -hmm. if, you know, if the time comes, you know, these, these folks certainly by, by the 
the mid stages of these dementias, they're not able to, to you know, have those conversations or express exactly articulate really exactly. Yeah. So, um, a couple more things about the typical pharmaceuticals that I found, and this information comes from um, alz.org, the National wonderful, Alzheimer's wonderful Association. Yeah, fantastic resource. Um, but most of these drugs, and I guess this refers to the cholinesterase inhibitors, but that they delay the progression of symptoms by maybe six to twelve months, and for about fifty percent of patients exactly. who try them. So there's there's folks that they just don't work for, and this was disheartening to to hear. I mean, they're they're testing new drugs for Alzheimer's all the time because the numbers are quite growing. staggering. Yeah. They're growing, and I I don't remember the many millions that, oh, you know, by 2020. The baby boomer population right. is exploding. They're coming into that age right. um, where we're seeing more of this. It's really uh, phenomenal what we have in store for us Yeah. Um, as yeah. far as uh, the number of people with dementia and the number of families or caregivers that will be needed to take care of them. Right, as well. right. And, and as they're testing these pharmaceutical drugs, most of those clinical trials are failing, and that's yeah. Super disheartening. I mean, you know, and then the FDA process for drug approval mm -hmm. can take 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. So, it's, I mean, if, if they're starting now <laughs> on a new drug in 12 years, assuming that it's moderately successful, it's it may come to market. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So we're using what we can. We, we're using what we have. Um, here in Maine, um, one of the options that we that we have is medical cannabis. Um, Ad agitation of Alzheimer's is a qualifying condition in, in our state. Um, and before we kind of get into the details of that, I wanted to share with our audience some of the research um, that is being done specifically on cannabis um, to treat dementias, and, and particularly Alzheimer's. There seems to be a great deal of focus on Alzheimer's mm -hmm. because, again, there's, you know, the majority of cases um, are Alzheimer's. Um, these, these next few slides um, refer to studies that are peer-reviewed, published in journals, and um, I located most, if not all of them, on pubmed.com, P-U-B-M-E-D.com, um, which is a clearinghouse of the National Institutes of Health, and they, they gather all kinds of studies. Uh, so you can go in there. It's very user-friendly. You can type in cannabis and Alzheimer's, and it'll just populate with all of these studies. So some very promising stuff is going on. Um, and, and before I, I dive right into this, um, there are two different types of studies. There's in vitro, which means in a petri dish, in a, in a lab, mm -hmm. um, and in vivo, which means it's a human trial. Um, because cannabis is a Schedule One drug, uh, meaning that it has no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse, um, it's difficult to do research using whole plant cannabis, so a lot of times these studies are done using synthesized forms of the cannabinoids. Um, but there's some very, very promising stuff, so let's take a look. Um, there was one meta-analysis by Grant and his team uh, that looked at um, studies from 1999 to 2005 um, and, and did an overview of over 36, I want to say 37, 38 studies um, of, of cannabinoids to treat um, dementias and, and Alzheimer's, uh, and they found that in particular, uh, cannabidiol, CBD, has these three properties, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and neuroprotective properties. And so if we go back to those early slides, mm -hmm. our neurons are degrading. Um, there is in inflammation, I don't know that we touched on it, but in Alzheimer's there is inflammation happening as well, correct? And there, the I can't speak to it very clearly, but what I've read is there is, uh, you know, the whole body. You know, mm. when we have inflammation in our body, it can end up progressing our uh, risk of Alzheimer's. So not just get. in the brain, any anywhere it can. Well, you know, the body is one right. unit, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> one organism, that's right. Um, and the conclusion from, from this meta-analysis, this big survey, um, was that, you know, if cannabinoid compounds were to become medicines, as if some of us aren't already using them that way, um, they would be expected to have a good margin of safety, even under conditions of longer term use, mm -hmm. which is very important when we look back at the slide before with all of the pharmaceuticals that can have da to cause damage, damage. As, we, as we're trying to heal. Yeah, and side effects. Yeah, yeah. Um, in 2006, they did a, a lab study where they used uh, THC, which is the compound that that causes psychoactivity, that causes the high mm -hmm. in cannabis, 
Um, and they found that it actually inhibited those beta amyloid proteins from sticking it, and, and building up. It, it stopped them. So it, it was doing that, um, and it was preventing the cell death. It was sort of like stimulating those mitochondria and keeping the cell engine going. So um, they, they found that it was treating both the symptoms and the progression. So that behavioral, yeah, yeah, just really amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, also in 2006, this one was exciting because it was a human study, very small N, which is the number of people uh, that were studied, but um, they used a, a low dose of Marinol, mm -hmm. which is that THC molecule, but it's synthesized. It's the pharmaceutical version. Yes. Whereas whole plant cannabis is a, a Schedule One drug, Marinol is Schedule Three. It can be prescribed, your insurance will pay for it, et cetera. Um, and they, they looked at these six patients and, and found that, you know, with immediate and long-lasting results, they were able to significantly reduce agitation and motor activity. And there's a term for that in dementia called sundowning. Yes. Is, can, can you tell us a little bit more about sundowning? It's a really interesting phenomenon that um, happens anywhere between, you know, maybe 2 in the afternoon to really sundown bedtime, 9 o'clock at night, um, where uh, agitation increases. Hmm. Um, and it's, it's very common, especially in the dementia facility. You can kind of see the, the amping up and wow. more motor roughness. I want to get up. I don't really quite know where I am. I'm wandering. Um, I, maybe I'm crying more. I'm just overall uh, uncomfortable, kind hmm. of crawling out of my skin. It's, it's a very, and, and in the homes as well. It's not just people are in a group in a facility. It's, right. A lot of families will tell you they'll say, "Oh, it's we'll do this in the morning if we're going to do this because you know oh, after okay. four o'clock or so it's not a good time for mom to do uh, uh, anything like she that." So it's too wound up. Yep. And, oh wow. Wound okay. Up. All right. Um, well, so so again, human human test and and uh, promising results using synthetic mm -hmm. THC here. Uh, in 2014, this was a, a pretty exciting um, study out of the University of Florida. Uh, again, in the lab, in a petri dish, but they found that THC uh, lowered the levels of those bad proteins uh, when it was when the THC was applied at low doses. So you don't need a whole lot of it, um, and they were they were actually seeing it um, reduce the the buildup of those those plaques. Uh, there was no toxicity to healthy cells that remained, uh, and again, it found that that these low doses were kind of like juicing the, the engine of the cells um, and, and keeping them healthy. And then this, we just had to add this slide yesterday because this uh, study just uh, came, you know, sort of hit the headlines yesterday. Um, Dr. Schubert at the Salk Institute, uh, again, in a petri dish, but um, he, he exposed these, these cells to THC and found, again, reduced protein levels and that it's, you know, eliminating that inflammatory response that the proteins cause. It's like the proteins are agitating the, the cells and, and just, you know, um, exacerbating everything. And again, THC um, applied directly, again, applied directly to cells in a Petri dish um, had, you know, immediate and, and visible and meaningful um, results. So, yeah. Um, actually, I want to go back because there's, there's a, if you want to read about that, there's, there's an article that I, I linked to there um, that, uh, that is very um, user-friendly. <laughs> you don't have to be a, <laughs> a, a, a PhD to understand it. So, um, I do want to say, before we get into, you know, the next segment of our, of our talk, um, that when we're, when we're hearing studies like that, um, we have to remember that it is different, that, they, that most of these studies are happening in labs. Most of them are using, um, you know, many of them are using synthesized versions of the cannabinoids, and they're using single compounds. Um, Karen has become something of a medical cannabis uh, expert, and so she knows that there are <laughs> um, a number of active compounds in the plant, and when we're using whole plant medicine, um, we're getting the benefit of all of those compounds and the, the, their synergies, how they interact between themselves as well, which we don't fully understand yet because it's so difficult to study this plant. Yeah. So uh, you see the picture on the right there, that is um, a female cannabis plant 
um, that plant actually lived its life in our cultivation facility. Uh, and you see that it's covered with those kind of white snowy looking crystals. And that is actually where those active uh, cannabinoids live in the plant for the most part. So when we're using a whole plant medicine, we're, we're going after the good stuff that's in those, those resin crystals there. All right, so we've, we've touched on this a little bit, and if you are just joining us, um, this is Becky with the Wellness Connection. I'm here with producer Ben and our very special guest, Karen McDonald, who is a hospice nurse and uh, sort of a specialist in the area of, of dementia. And we're talking about um, medical cannabis and, and uh, using that to treat dementia, particularly Alzheimer's. Um, so we've, we've covered this, you know, a little bit um, already, but I, I just wanted to make sure that we kind of captured all of the areas where if, if we're dealing with a patient with dementia, we might be seeing some, all exactly. <laughs> of these things. Some or all, you're right. Everyone, like you said, is, is different. Everyone okay. uh, presents differently. Uh, often, all of them are affected. Um, that is very really? common. But, wow. Um, just because one piece is missing doesn't mean they, they don't have certainly the, um, the dis destruction of this disease. Right. Uh, but right. Um, like we talked about, you know, memory is a big uh, issue. It's um, what's really interesting um, with a lot of our folks, um, the long-term uh, memory is preserved. Oh. So, and that's a different part of the brain where that is stored. Okay. It's so really fascinating. It that, is. Um, short term is where you start to see, you know, have a conversation with someone or, you know, you just told them something yesterday and they have no recollection of this conversation. Okay. But um, yet they can remember their teacher's name from second grade. Wow. And, you know, it's, it's a different part of the brain that's affected. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Focus, wandering, reasoning and judgment definitely mm -hmm. um, is, is affected. Of course, I can do this. I can walk out in that snow or I can, you know, the, the judgment piece. That wandering away. And we've, there's been a couple of cases recently in the news here in Maine where, yeah. where some elders have, have done that, have wandered. Off. Yeah. And then that short-term memory, you know, we oh. would say, okay, I walked from my car to here. Right. I know that I'm going to take here to my car. Well, they don't have that pathway, you know, so they forget, and then oh. they turn a corner, and I'll figure it out, and before long, they, they're uh, right. really lost. Really lost. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Are there any, um, totally unrelated to cannabis, but are there, do you, are you aware of any, um, I don't know, uh, tools that, that families can use? To there are. Actually, like a G I'm thinking GPS, the honestly. The Alzheimer's Association is wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, going to their website, they have so many different options out there for uh, families that are trying to uh, maintain a safe home environment yeah. for, um, you know, how do I not lock my house down <laughs> but keep them so I know if they're wandering because I can't be holding their hand 24-7. Right. Um, there's different uh, bracelets. If I'm found, mm -hmm. you know, please call this number. Um, there's controversy about people saying, do you implant something like you do with oh your, my your animals? You well, know, yeah. You know, some families would say, I'll do anything. Right. You know, right. And other people say, ooh, that's a little, yeah. little yeah. <laughs> funny. So, well, but, I, you know, I think if, if it's an option, I wouldn't I wouldn't judge a family who no, chose to, that's exactly to it. do that's, that. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Well, people do the best they can. Right. Uh, and it's right. a very devastating disease for the, the patient and definitely and the, the family. family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez. All right. So any other... Anything? Another thing, you know, you mentioned on here, the sleep changes. That mm -hmm. is very difficult for families as well, um, trying to get some sleep, going to bed, thinking that their loved one is sleeping, and then they're up, or they can't quite... Oh, know, okay. They doze and come back up, and then they're up wandering at night. So mm -hmm. sleep changes uh, definitely uh, are part of that. Irrationality, mood changes. You yeah. Know, just absolute rage and, and crying, and some of that is the centers that are affected. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of dementia, you know, sometimes with a vascular, you know, after someone has a stroke, they can have a type of vascular dementia, which is a little bit different, um, and you can have just uncontrolled crying, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which is very devastating uh, for the patient. And some of it is um, part of what's been affected in the brain. Some of it is, I don't know what's going on, and I'm terrified. Right, and, and I can't and communicate. I can't imagine wow. what the stimulus is or what their input is, mm -hmm. and how they interpret the world around them, and right. how scary that must be. Yeah. Uh, someone, uh, a woman I worked with who's um, very well versed uh, in dementia care, um, said, "Can you imagine being in a foreign country 
and uh, someone walks in your room at night, you don't speak the language, and they're trying to undress you. <laughs> um, and this is right. be like what it's like waking up in a nursing home and having someone come to do care on you. You don't yeah. understand what's happening. So what are you going to do? You're going to fight. Right. You're going to say, I'm in danger. I've got right. to fight. And so understanding where they're coming from, you know, yeah. a nice little... Yeah. I, you're, you're making me think of my grandmother who had a stroke um, and and was aphasic. She couldn't speak after mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. but she could definitely communicate. And she she did have um, we, we think that you know she she had some of the stroke related dementia. And and you have to imagine the the sweetest most most grandmotherly grandmother, right? Plump, blue, white haired, beautiful woman, um, suddenly uh, hitting. Hidden <laughs> for nurses, um, you know. So it's and families are devastated. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. tell you how many families would say, you know, my mother's never said a swear word in her life. Right. I can't believe she would be mortified if she knew she was. If she that. right, if she knew she was. Yes, saying. if she knew. So, well, I think I think um, something that's coming through loud and clear is that you know this is a horrible disease for the patient, but also for the family, especially if they're taking on the the. Exactly. Role. Keeping keeping mom or dad in the home. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about cannabis. We've, we've you know heard some of the scientific studies, and and um, in just a minute we're going to get to a, an actual uh, research project that that Karen and I are, are working on together. Um, but before we, we start this, I, I want to say that uh, agitation of Alzheimer's is a qualifying condition uh, for the use of medical cannabis in Maine. Um, I think that uh, there are some other conditions that may come along with the dementias um, that would also qualify people, particularly probably intractable pain, I would think, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, for some of these folks. But this is very exciting. The um, agitation from Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. as a diagnosis to treat something, uh, to have uh, a medication in some form, it's very difficult because what we have now, the antipsychotics, the anxiolytics, the anti-anxiety, Ativan type of thing, these are really off-label for um, treating agitation for really? Alzheimer's. So it does kind of back providers into a corner. Um, so so that, that, is, um, that is sundowning, that is yes. everyday agitated, mm-hmm. angry, however that's yes. manifesting, and we have these things that... What they're they're not they weren't designed right. to treat that, but they uh, they're what we have, right. and so um, and why why do we use them then? Do they just blunt affect? Is that yes? The attempt is to try to uh, help these patients be more comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's really what the what everyone wants um, right. underlying it. I do want to put a, a little plug into um, just as a nurse, I have to, to do this. Piece. Yes. Um, you know, anyone that thinks there is a, a, a dementia or an Alzheimer's, you know, there is uh, uh, the provider will do a workup because there are other things that could be causing some of these similar behaviors. Mm. It could be a UTI or an infection of some sort. You know, there's a lot of different things that they would rule out to make sure that it is true Alzheimer's or dementia. So, right. Um, I just kind of want to put that plug in there. Gotcha. Um, but, yes, uh, some of these are kind of off-label, kind of, you know, we're going to use this, you know, uh, just saying I'm giving Risperdal for um, dementia with agitation is really becoming more frowned upon. You know, okay. Are we doing it because this person is a harm to themselves or others, uh, or do they have really disturbing hallucinations? Mm-hmm. And those are more accepted terms rather than just agitation. So if I mom's see. running around and she's, you know, trying to open the windows and crawl out and she's been doing this for three days straight and the family has absolutely, you know, at the end of their rope, mm-hmm. it's still kind of a touchy subject of saying, well, let's give them, you know, mm. Haldol, Risperdal, Seroquel, these things. Right. Um, but it's what there is. But it's what there is. It's, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, let's, let's, you know, cannabis is an option. It is an option for, for agitation here in Maine. Um it does come with, you know, it, it, it's not something that you take it's like a Tylenol and you just don't notice anything, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you're using whole plant cannabis, um, even even a, a, a tincture or something that is high in CBD and, and other non-psychoactive um, parts of the plant, um, there's some THC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there, there may be uh, euphoria from, from mild to moderate. Um, I personally think that you know, it, as far as side effects go, that's not a bad one mm-hmm. to have in this mm-hmm. case. You know, <laughs> something that makes you feel feel good is great. Um, but we do need to be aware that, that you know there can be motor coordination problems. 
short-term memory loss, and so it's kind of counterintuitive because those are two issues that patients with dementia are dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, red eyes, dry mouth, it can lower blood pressure. Typically, blood pressure will go up in the first 15 minutes or so after administration, but then go down over time, mm -hmm. so you want to be on top of that. Um, because many of these patients are also on blood pressure right. meds and mm -hmm. blood thinners and all sorts of good stuff. Um, it can cause heart palpitations, um, anxiety, panic, paranoia, and hallucinations. Um, I will say that for the most part, those, those last several um, side effects happen more frequently when people are using edible forms mm -hmm. for very good reasons involving our liver and how we process those, those active compounds. Um, and also that they tend to happen when people have taken too much. And one thing that we are finding with cannabis, using cannabis to treat um, these sorts of, of conditions, uh, it does reinforce what they're finding in the scientific labs, that low doses are often enough. You don't need a whole lot of the stuff to, to make a difference. Um, and like with traditional meds as well, like you say, you know, start low. You know, yes. Just use yes. the minimal that's going to be effective. Right, yeah. right. And it might take a little bit to find out what exactly that is. But, um, but again, cannabis has no known LD50. There is no dose where, you know, half of the test subjects will, will die. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we don't believe that there has been a cannabis-only fatality in human history that we're aware of. Uh, and there are no known negative drug interactions. You, you do, again, because of the blood pressure changes, you do want to stay on top of that, but it's mm -hmm. not going to cause a, a negative interaction if you are using cannabis and taking your blood pressure meds. Mm -hmm. So, um, and as Karen pointed out, always start low, always go slow. Um, it, there's also appetite stimulation, mm -hmm. um, which can be a good thing for these patients, I think. Absolutely. Um, Sometimes that's uh, something that we see they just don't have any interest um, anymore mm -hmm. in eating. There's um, whether part of it is interest in eating, appetite. Part of it is depending on whether on the progression of the illness are they able to swallow. You know, the part mm -hmm. of the brain is that mm -hmm. tells the muscle to move. You know, the food right. back in the mouth or the muscles in the, the throat are get affected um, wow. as well. So, uh, but uh, weight loss is certainly a, a, a problem. Common, thing that we see. Yeah. I think there's one other thing that, that you pointed out when we were going through these slides, and that is that um, there, in, in traditional medical um, documents, there, there's, you'll often hear that cannabis is addictive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that that is a potential side effect. Um, I, I can say from 15 years of experience working directly with patients who are using medical cannabis that um, dependence is possible. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's typically more psychological than physical, um, and this is borne out by scientific studies that, that show that even a, a heavy or frequent cannabis user, um, when they stop, uh, experiences similar side effects to a, a heavy coffee drinker who stops, you know, cold turkey mm -hmm. drinking coffee. Mm -hmm. um, some irritability, some anxiety, um, you know, maybe a couple of restless nights mm -hmm. getting to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of addictive um, potential, in terms of side effects, um, I do think that it, it measures up to mm -hmm. the things that we have now. <laughs> if someone's been on uh, Ativan routinely long term, you know, we don't just stop that cold turkey. You know, mm. we, we taper it down, let the body get used to being without it. So it's the right. same, the same idea. Yeah. Right. Um, when we're talking about cannabis, I mean, it, you just pointed out that, that many of these folks can't swallow, and that that can be a problem. Um, the most common method of, of using cannabis that most people think of is inhaling it, right? Mm -hmm. And I would I would bet that a lot of these patients that we're talking about with dementia might not be able to make a lip seal or to, to do that. And two things come to mind. One would be traditionally just actually smoking, you wouldn't want something that's right. on fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good point, good point. <laughs> but the vape uh, option um, yes. as well is, you know, making that lip seal and coordinating. And that's the same with, you know, you'll see people that routinely use inhalers for maybe asthma or COPD just aren't able to kind of process that and know that they need to time it and breathe in right. as they're pushing the inhaler together. So right. um, that is an issue with that. So what happens right. to patients with asthma who have been using an inhaler and no longer can? Oftentimes, um, if we're using, say, duonebs, um, which routinely is used for that, uh, you'll move over to a nebulizer machine, okay. which... Um, 
kind of pushes the air, you know. It has a mask. It, yes, and, okay. a mask on. Okay. Uh, sometimes there's a, a little pipe they can hold, but it still kind of pushes it through. And gotcha. as they progress, generally they set the pipe down. They just don't really understand it anymore. Right. Uh, put the mask on. Um, depending on how long it takes, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes they're 5 to 15 minutes, you know, to really process. You know, if people are agitated moving around, they won't always keep it on. Sometimes they'll sit there and goes off with it on. They'll get right. their, their meds in that way. So that is <laughs> gotcha. an option, though. That, okay. Well, I love hearing um, about the nebulizer because, you know, there are there are tabletop vaporizers for cannabis. Um, but I think because this is this is a, maybe a, a population that that has not – advocated, you know, there hasn't been a lot of advocacy for this population in the medical cannabis arena, um, there, there isn't that mask fitting yet because, you know, vaporizing is so great because it, it's, it's instant. Mm-hmm. The effect, you know, you're going to see an effect within a minute if, if you have wow, inhaled. Um, and it would, it would be lovely if there were that sort of a, a mask. Sure, it's about, you know, you know, I know and I'm not versed in this at all, but uh, with children with seizures, mm-hmm. they've used and had quite good luck, yes. haven't they? And yes. what method were they able to use? They are, that is a wonderful segue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they did not, I love it, I love it. Um, that is typically a tincture or an oil. That's what they use, okay. And they'll, they'll just put it between the cheek and gum, typically. And, um, and, and that absorbs rapidly. It's not quite the, you know, immediate... Um, relief that, that vaporizing can give, but I'll tell you what, it, you know, you, you can see some of these videos online where it is within a minute or so, or two minutes, that, that it starts to work because the mucous membrane is, you know, you're, 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 is that right in your mouth? It is. Yes. It's very <laughs> vascular. Um, it, it doesn't have to go through the digestion of the stomach. Right. Uh, a lot of our meds that we use, especially the end-of-life care, uh, where people are maybe not responding and, but need that uh, symptom management, we yes. will put meds uh, under their tongue or inside their yep. cheek. And, and that, I think, for, for this population is a great solution as well, those tinctures. Um, if, they, if a patient is still able to chew and swallow, there are just a huge range of, of infused edibles and sweets and savories. And, um, you know, we're now offering um, powdered drink mixes, tea and cocoa. So if you've got a patient who is, who is still able to swallow and, and, you know, likes those sorts of things, um, those are options. Mm-hmm. Typically, if you're not putting it between cheek and gum, if you're if you're ingesting, if you're eating and chewing and digesting, um, you may not see an effect for up to two hours, um, depending on the patient's metabolism and, and what else they have they have eaten that day. Um, but that is that is an option, and and you know there's no odor. That's something that people are concerned about. Um, not so much with vaping, but definitely with smoking. Um, you know, so ingestion is is a, a good. Um, Option. It can be difficult to titrate, especially like some of the you know the cookies. But we're getting much better at that. Like our our edibles are now all lab tested, and we can tell you that there's you know 10 milligrams of THC in this cookie. And that's as we'll see in just a moment. That's a that's a, a whopping dose for somebody who hasn't <laughs> used um, before. So, and then there are also infused topicals, um, which you know you use just like a Tiger Balm or a Bengay. Um, great for uh, Arthritic and neuropathic pain, great for skin conditions. Um, as, as we are going to talk about in just a moment, we have seen some amazing uh, wound healing as well. Um, and I think pressure wounds are something that it's, you know, that's not a, the, the disease isn't doing that, but when patients are in bed. And you're immobile and right. not eating very well and you're in a compromised state, wounds occur and are difficult to heal. From. Right, right. And, you know, as, as you get older, your skin is thin, yeah. you bruise more easily yeah, anyway. Yeah, cutaneous fat level that's our right. kind of protect our cushion. Right, right, right. So, um, when it comes to determining dosage, we do have to remember that these are patients who are not able to, you know, say, yep, that's enough. <laughs> I feel it now. <laughs> um, and so, again, we're, we're at a point now where we, we can measure the level of THC because that is the compound that causes the euphoria that can feel unfamiliar or strange to some people. Um, and so what we're finding is that for the average person, a five milligram dose of THC is a good entry level where it's not going to be so overwhelming, you know, that, that you're feeling this euphoria or this new sensation in your body that it is unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Um, 10 milligrams for somebody who is a, a regular user is, is an average dose. I would imagine in the next couple of years, the industry will come to call that maybe even a standard mm-hmm. dose, you know. 
Um, so these are these are definitely options. Um, that is a stock photo in the middle. I'm not uh, saying that that woman has had any cannabis, but I just love her face. So <laughs> I don't think that you know. Hopefully, hopefully she's feeling no pain. <laughs> All right, so let's say that we have, you know, mom or dad um, or Uncle Jimmy, and we're dealing with, um, you know, dementia. We have we have the diagnosis, and we're interested in trying cannabis. This this piece of the process can be the most challenging, I think, and that's what we're finding in in this program we'll be talking about. Um, we at WCM always recommend that a patient who wishes to try medical cannabis start by having the conversation with their primary care doctor or, or their specialist if, you know, they've got an oncologist or something. And ask them because any MD, DO, or nurse practitioner in the state of Maine can certify a patient to use this stuff. And the list of qualifying conditions you see on the right there. Um, what we're running into a little bit is that there are some practices that discourage their doctors from doing certifications. Yeah. Is that that's what uh, I'm seeing. It's it's very interesting. People tend to have um, strong feelings about this, and mm -hmm. I think uh, just to kind of, from my perspective, yeah. Um, yeah. alone is uh, it's kind of lumped in with um, there's so much pressure right now on providers to minimize uh, prescribing of narcotics because of mm. the opioid crisis that in the narcotic crisis that we have. So there's a lot of pressure on them, uh, and rightfully so. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. um, that needed to come about. So um, putting more things out in the community, putting more things is, is a concern of theirs. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's that piece of it. Personal feelings. You know, mm -hmm. people have their own personal feelings around it oh, yeah. uh, that needs to be um, acknowledged. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, we're talking about something that is legal in our state, but not necessarily legal nationally. And, you know, uh, a lot of funding comes from national organizations like Medicare. and right. whatnot. So um, maybe you can speak more of that. I think that's a concern that I hear most frequently is... We're going to lose our federal yeah. funding. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I'll tell you, we are not aware. We've looked. Um, we are not aware of any hospital, skilled nursing facility, hospice facility um, that has lost federal funding because they allow patients to use, because doctors certify patients to use. Um, we actually asked for clarification on this from CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and they wrote us back, and this is an email exchange, you know, this is not a memo, this does not have the force of law, but they wrote us back that they are looking for this. In states where it's legal, if, an, if a facility is allowing its use, they're not going to get dinged during an audit, you know, and if they're not allowing it, that, that's, you know, the CMS is really taking a hands-off approach. But it, it, that's a difficult message. We're, we're battling, you know, decades worth of, of sort of ingrained thoughts about this plant. And so many doctors, you know, for whatever reason, are not comfortable certifying. Um, and in that case, patients have to go to a cannabis specialist doctor, somebody who has a private practice and, and just does cannabis certifications. Um, I will say that um, it is frustrating because what should be covered under an office visit, you know, picking up the certification card, um, for folks who have insurance, you know, when, when their doctor won't certify them, they are essentially costing that patient, you know, depending on the doctor's fees, 150 to $300. And that's, that's the, you know, of concern. Uh, you? It is. It is. But I think we, we, have, we have made it over those hurdles and we have our certification in hand. Um, What's the next step? <laughs> it's like, where do I get it? Uh, and in Maine, there are three options. Patients can grow their own uh, at home, and or a family member could. Uh, I don't know that that you know if if you have not previously been cultivating cannabis at home, I don't know that that's something you want to undertake at the same time you're dealing with mom or dad who is dealing with dementia. Um, the other options are to designate a dispensary. You see the picture at the bottom is our, our Portland dispensary. Um, or they can designate an individual to be what in Maine is called a caregiver um, to, to grow and provide the cannabis for them. So they have those options. Um, and it really is a personal choice. And I, I love that Maine allows us to grow at home um, because that's, you know, that, that's very empowering. Um, but we do have these other options for folks who are not able to do that. Any quality provider, if you're getting cannabis from a dispensary or from a, from a caregiver, um, you should be looking for 
many options, both in, in the types of product, ingestibles versus topicals uh, versus smoked products, and then also potency. Um, I, I believe that a quality provider should be able to coach and explain their products clearly and talk to you about the endocannabinoid system and sit with you and, and mom or dad and, and kind of get a sense of what, what are our goals and, and you know what's the best way to get there. Uh, nowadays, they should be lab testing. Uh, it's available in Maine, and there's no reason not to do it for, for both contaminants and potency. Uh, and then, you know, give receipts, track inventory, charge sales tax, no pesticides, and definitely um, make you feel safe. So, um, and those, those options are, are out there. And now I, I want to wrap up our, our talk by, by going into um, a little bit of detail about the Mark Bushy Compassion Program here at WCM, and you have been such a great help. Um, with this. This is a program named for one of our members, Mark Bushy, who passed away this year of um, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and he had used cannabis in the, in the last, um, you know, years of his, his disease as it progressed um, and felt that it really did extend his life and certainly improved his quality of life. And so we wanted to honor him and so we, were, we have created this hospice program where we are working with area hospice agencies to identify patients who are um, who meet that Medicare definition for hospice, six months or less to live, um, and who are open to trying medical cannabis to improve quality of life, and and I had described we had described this program to, to you, Karen, and um, you you identify very quickly a very amazing patient, and I, I just want to kind of hand it off to you and let you <laughs> give us a little bit of detail. We'll call her Joan, um, yes. but it was so nice to see her again this morning. Uh, she started medical cannabis treatment in late May, yes. just about a month ago, a month and a couple of days ago. Okay, so. I think I just have to say the stars aligned. It did. For they, the did. they did. <laughs> they did. all come together. Yes. Um, I, I do need to say that I'm very fortunate that I work um, – at New Hope Hospice, it's a uh, small nonprofit independent hospice um, that has very always been very patient focused, patient choice. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the goal of care, and so they've been very supportive of um, yes. bringing this uh, yes. forward. Anything that can make the quality of life improve for our patients. So yeah, I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, so uh, some of our folks have. My, I first came across uh, medical cannabis in the hospice population with someone who had come from uh, uh, out of the area um, that was already using the cannabis, um, and they were on it for a, a cancer diagnosis. Uh, but I was um, amazed at how much relief they mm -hmm. received. You know, my usual toolbox wasn't quite doing it, right. and then this did. This really uh, brought them extreme comfort from nausea. Um, agitation and pain. Great. So um, I went to a uh, pain symposium thinking, who else is, knows about this? What are we doing in this state? You know, how do I even right. approach this topic? Uh, and there was the wellness connection with a wonderful display and all the information and, and I was like, oh, that's wonderful. And so uh, it, it kind of progressed from there. So yeah. our patient Joan, um, fascinating woman, uh, um, has been living with and seeing not only her primary care provider, but uh, a Jerry Psych uh, provider who actually had suggested to uh, the family that, you know, maybe you should consider some cannabis, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. However, he wasn't comfortable at uh, <laughs> able certifying. To certify, so then we went through the whole, uh, how do we find the certification process? But um, the, uh, um, the family really took the lead and really wanted to make this happen. Um, yep. They are very interested in being part of research, um, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm able to articulate that. Um, Joan really had been struggling with uh, frontal temporal dementia, which is that um, not able to speak, uh, rapid speech, garbled speech, pressured. Um, she had an affect of almost a pained, grunting, crying, mm. and that was her means of uh, expressing herself, yeah. um, holding her breath, um, just almost turning red in the face, a lot of sundowning, agitation. Mm -hmm. Uh, family struggled for years with medication and what can I do to keep her safe and not over sedated and right. that was the balance that they tried to, to strike um, when she came on with us um, she had been declining and uh, really when we started the cannabis with her she 
um, was a bed bound. She was yeah. really uh, having some uh, severe medical issues and was really, we were thinking, at the end of life. I, at that point. I remember yeah. you saying that she had been in bed for about three or four days yeah. and, and you thought yeah. it was... Yeah. Yeah. She wasn't going to get back out. So, so in that, having that happen, um, where she was really non-responsive at that point, um, uh, they weren't able to give her a lot of her standard meds mm. because of swallow issues. Obviously, if you're not able to swallow or right. wait, you can't take a pill. Right. So she had stopped basically taking her um, Seroquel and Ativan and a host of other things. Um, and then we... As she started to wake up, the family decided, I really want to try this. You know, mm -hmm. what do you think? And, you know, you've been wonderful because <laughs> this is not my area. I don't know. I, said, I have no idea. That's why we're here. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it was great that uh, you came and sat down with the family, and the family was wonderful to allow me to be a fly on the wall and kind of take it all in and learn. Yeah, because, yeah. Um, this is, it's not something that, um, you know, I can really provide for them, but it's great that you can. Yeah, you can step well, in. You facilitated, and, and that was, that was amazing. That. So yeah. in the meantime, we've seen... Um, it's been over a month now. Yeah. She's up. She's walking. <laughs> uh, she's walking quite steadily. Mm -hmm. She is um, articulating more. She counted to ten the other day. She sat and watched a movie and commented on the movie. Yeah. Uh, a caregiver came in and said, hi, I'm so-and-so, and then decided to try and repeat it again, and she said, actually, you already said that. <laughs> <laughs> already told me that. <laughs> she was using her hand to pick up her cup and drink. That her was own. one of the most yeah, amazing. Very, we, we did yeah. visit Joan and her family this morning, and, and to see her take that spoon and scoop a but bit of cereal and Put it bang, in right in her mouth. Yeah, coordination, motor coordination. Just incredible. Yeah. You know. And, you know, this is uh, a month out now right. um, without um, having all of these antipsychotics and anti angiolytics and everything else they were using. So it isn't, you know, I, I thought at the beginning maybe it's a honeymoon where all oh, those are just getting out of her system. Right. She's waking up. Uh, no, she's really off that. They've been using the uh, CBD tincture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you've been helpful with advising them on what, how much to give and when to give. I'll and tell you, I am, I am so impressed by how little they actually need. Um, she's getting, the, the slide says a half a dropper. Um, as of about last week, we upped it to three quarters of a dropper because I think she, she had a, like an initial period of onboarding and getting used to it and then she sort of plateaued. Yeah. And so we decided to just, you know, crank it up a little bit. Um, one time a day. Once in the morning and, and occasionally her partner said... With that sundowning mm, late in yeah, the day, um, yeah. rather than reach for that Seroquel or reach for that at the end, she'll reach for... Um, yeah. The, PPD tincture and is having uh, very good luck with, um, and I think she's been giving some, you know, melatonin with it at night. Right, she's, right. Uh, to help, you know. But the fact sleep. that she is off of all of those pharmaceutical, her drug list was impressive, and and only using this and the melatonin, it, it's been a success beyond what I honestly oh. expected. I thought if we if we give her a couple of good nights sleep, you know. That's that's really what I thought. Yeah. You know, I looked at as and, and with other cases this may be where it's just another tool in the toolkit. Right. That you know we have all these things that it's worked. That yeah. It's an extra thing that you know what it might give you a little added benefit. That's right. really what I was thinking. Right. I think this case is quite phenomenal. It may not be um, the standard. Right. Uh, but right. It's exciting to see. It really is. Um, the alertness, the tracking. She tracks as you walk in the room. Visually, yes. Um, she yeah. Has, uh, up and around. She's gotten out for a ride in the car. She went from being bedridden to having some quality of life. Yeah. And that is really uh, you know, what hospice is about is, you know, how can your life be better? Right. And I'm right. really thrilled. Something that I'm really excited about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two things, actually. There is um, the, the topical that mm -hmm. you brought them um, and you, you know, talked to them about using it. It has anti-inflammatory uh, components to it. Yep. Um, they were using it on her shoulder that she's always had trouble with. If they would help guide her or if she was unsteady, you know, she would grimace and pull back because mm. it hurt. Um, they're not seeing that as much. Um, wow. Limping a little bit at times. They've been trying it on her knees, and they, seem, they say that it's really been helping with that, which yeah. is, is uh, wonderful. Um, but she developed a pressure sore, a big blister mm. on her heel. Yeah. Um, it was pretty large, and it was pretty... Um, it was like two inches across, don't you think? Yeah, an it, inch was a, hand? it was a large was... sore, and uh, I was using our standard um, dressings that we would use, and I was, uh, was coming from Meta Honey to try and heal that because it had uh, became uh, very macerated and, and uh, no 
you know, white and kind of yeah. um, moist and some drainage, and, and then it was kind of a black underneath. Yeah, that was scary. It's a, yeah, not a very good sign. Right. It could have been dry blood, or it could have been a, a what's called SCAR or a very dead tissue. Right. Um, so I wasn't holding out a lot of hope. She doesn't have great circulation, so I didn't think it would work. Right. So we were using what uh, we traditionally used, and you had talked with uh, the family and suggested, you know, maybe you want to try. Um, so put, I, put some you know, on it. the <laughs> family wanted to try it. I said, absolutely, it's you know, your your choice, and yeah. and they were very uh, excited to do that. So I was thrilled to go and look and see, <laughs> and it's really only been a few weeks. And yeah. it's been, uh, after I the first she, week, it, I would say about 50% healed it, it immediately, that quick of right. time. And then today when I went back, it's completely resolved. Beautiful, Beautiful pink, healthy yes. tissue. And yeah. that just really surprised me um, yeah. how yeah. well that worked. So that I'm was, really, I'm so glad that the family spoke up and said, I really want to try this. Let's, right. Let's <laughs> see what we can do. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm really glad that I work in a place that said, you know what? Family choice matters. Right. Patient choice matters. Exactly. And, and this is um, what they should be able to do if they want to do it. And it's it worked out wonderfully. It it really did. And I I don't think we could have asked for a better you know first family to be yeah. working with or, or a, a better advocate in you. Um, and again, this is one patient. This is you know the results. Your results may differ, but um, to see the improved quality of life for Joan and for her partner. Um, it was really quite uh, striking and, and impressive. Um, if you are listening and you are curious about this uh, Mark Bushy Hospice Program or Compassion Program, uh, you can find out more by sending us an email at mbcp, mbcp at mainwellness.org. Um, and we can give you a little bit more information about that program um, and and in addition to, to that, uh, there are a couple more resources that we've mentioned. Definitely the Alzheimer's Association, uh, which does have a main chapter. You see their uh, website address there. And then PubMed, which again is that uh, clearinghouse of uh, research and data. And we're hoping that, that as the Mark Bushy program continues, um, we will we will be able to contribute in some way to that body of, <laughs> of research and, and data. And that's what it'll take, you yeah. know. Uh, yes examples, things, you know, positive stories that have worked um, yeah. Yeah. and make people understand that this is a viable option. Yes, yes. So, so many awesome takeaways. I know we're, we're over time and I appreciate those of you who have been able to, to stick with us. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, cannabis is is an option, um, you know, a, and one that the, the dementia patient might not be thinking of, but hopefully their family or or maybe hospice providers are uh, thinking of. I think the importance of hospice care is is huge, and the work that you do is is so important. And and New Hope is is really, um, as you say, you know, by, by putting the patient and the family needs first. That's that's. Uh, I, I can't even say enough good things about, <laughs> about your mission. It's it's what it's all about. Um, and and advanced directives and yes. thinking the, about this stuff ahead of time. You Put know, it down, anything, yeah. yes. Get it in writing, have the conversation, yeah. be prepared, you know, uh, take some control. Yeah. Uh, where in a lot of times you aren't in control. This is where you can take right. control. Right. And, put it in and patients can add mm -hmm. either an advanced directive or a post document, mm -hmm. which is physician's orders for what end of what, no, like life, life sustaining treatments. Um, patients can add cannabis to those things. Mm -hmm. And and those are legal documents that, that Providers and family members must respect, correct? Absolutely. So. And, it, you know, the person themselves can change any time. It's not like I've right. written this down and that's it, you know. But, yes, it's it's a guide. It's a guide for providers to understand that this is part of your wishes. This is what you want um, along with uh, a host of many other things. Right. But, um, your primary care provider can sit with you. Um, and uh, on an off note, uh, uh, Medicare did just um, pass that they – physicians can bill to sit down. It's the CPT code now. They can actually have an end-of-life discussion visit with wow. you for just this talk. Just alone. to have this talk. Yes. That's Which so, is important. Huge. Which so important. So important. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, again, thank you um, to our audience for, for being with us. Uh, I, I'm not seeing any sign from producer Ben that we have any questions out there. Um, but if anything comes to mind, um, I never think of my questions in the moment. I think of them like when I'm driving mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can always email us at info at mainwellness.org um, or mbcp at mainwellness.org. 
And um, this is Becky D. And, and again, thank you for joining us today on behalf of producer Ben and the wonderful Karen McDonald from New Hope Hospice up here in, are you guys in Bangor? We're in Eddington. Eddington, just in just Eddington. New Hope Hospice in Eddington. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a lovely afternoon. Thank, thank you me. so much. Mm -hmm.